Hello and welcome to our webinar, um, Head to Tail Visual Clues to Pet Bird Health with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Um, and also we have a special guest. So why we are waiting for some people just to, the last uh, stragglers to log on, uh, Dr. Lamb, uh, do you want to reintroduce us to that gorgeous bird behind you, who that is? Yes, this is, uh, this is Arroyo. He's uh, hanging out with us again today just to be a part of the, the show. Um, we're going to talk about uh, physical exam. So I don't know how much he'll want to participate, but he may participate a little bit. We'll see. We'll see what he does. Um, but uh, he is very happy just eating a, some papaya right now. So his beak might be a little messy. <laughs> nice. He has no idea he might be our, um, our, demonstra our demo bird for the head to tail. <laughs> like, he's like, what? <laughs> no, that's good. Um, all right, I think we're gonna, we'll probably have a, a bit of questions today because this is a very popular topic and uh, I know you have a presentation. So um, let's give people, I'm just gonna like another 30 seconds uh, and then we will dive right in. Uh, I believe you have a presentation for us. So um, there we go. So let's see, three, two, one. He's look, I'm looking at your, your Amazon there. <laughs> he's he's going to steal the show again. Um, all right. All right. I think let's just, let's just dive right into this topic, Dr. Lamb, if you don't mind. Um, okay. I'm going to let you take it away. And then okay. we'll, we'll Sounds good. All right. Um, so our topic today is uh, doing an at-home physical examination with your, with your pet bird. Um, and the, the point of it is to kind of go with along with sort of the last several talks we've been going over of, um, you know, uh, safety, uh, first aid, uh, just more sort of at home health stuff that you can see on your bird that you can cue into to know um, if they're healthy or if they need to be seen by a veterinarian and, and get some help. Um, so the, the physical exam that uh, veterinarians do with birds is, is really the most helpful thing um, that a veterinarian is able to do. A, a good physical evaluation um, is priceless. It is something that um, a veterinarian who is skilled at uh, working with birds, knowing what to look for on an examination goes a long way to more so than any other test um, to help a bird do well. Um, and so my hope today is that I can convey some of the stuff that we as veterinarians do um, to look at a bird, to assess its health, to help you guys be able to kind of pick up on those things at home um, so that again, you know, if your bird's healthy um, or if there's some problems going on and you need to get them seen for a little more in-depth evaluation. So I'm gonna share my screen because I do have a presentation here. Okay, and why, why you do that, Dr. Lamb, I'm just gonna remind our, our viewers that um, we'll do a Q&A after the presentation and to use your, um, the Q&A button feature instead of the chat feature. So just a reminder, buddy. All right, all right, I'm just gonna share my screen here and we're gonna pull up our PowerPoint. All right, um, so. Our talk is head to tail visual cues to pet bird health. So what I've done with this particular talk is I used Arroyo um, for several pictures. And if he needs to demonstrate further uh, during the talk, uh, he may present something for us if, if need be. Um, so, so really the reason it was titled head to toe is, is because that's honestly what a lot of veterinarians do is they start from the head and then they work their way down the body um, to the toes. Um, because when you're doing an evaluation of an animal, you want to have a systematic approach to what you're doing. You want, kind of want to do it the same all the time, because if you key in on one little area, you may miss something going on somewhere else. So it's really important that when you're doing these examinations of your pet, you kind of get into a groove and a, a rhythm of doing the same thing all the time so that you don't miss something. Therefore, a lot of people just try to make it easy and start from the top and go to the bottom. So 
things to look at starting at the top. Um, looking at the head, the things to really cue in on. Um, number one, the nostrils, you know, first having a look at those nostrils. In this photo here, you can see that Arroyo's nostrils are nice and clear. There's no debris around the nostrils. Um, the opening to the, the nasal cavity there is nice and clear of anything obstructing it. When we have birds that have respiratory infections, um, you can see nasal discharge, just like a person who has a runny nose. Um, and so when we're looking at their nostrils, we wanna see them being nice and open. Um, different species will have different shapes to the nostrils. They're either gonna be this nice round appearance that Arroyo is demonstrating versus some other species have kind of like a more of a slit. So for example, the, the cockatoos tend to have a little bit more of like a, a little slit or sort of an oblong sort of appearance um, to, the, to the nasal opening. Um, the point of what you're looking for is that that nostril opening is clear that it's symmetrical, meaning both sides look the same, that the opening is symmetrical on both sides, and that there's just no debris around it. These little feathers that are right around the nostril up here, if they've been sneezing, um, they may do a good job of kind of wiping stuff off of their beak or even picking their little nostril um, with their toe and getting debris out. But sometimes the feathers that are right up above the head here, or up, excuse me, on the head above the nostril um, will have debris stuck to them. So that's something to look at. Um, the nostril may be clear, but there may be something stuck up here. And if there is, that can be an indication that they've been sneezing and they've been having discharge. I will say the other thing that I will commonly see with birds when there is debris stuck up on those feathers right up above the nose, it doesn't always mean that it's a respiratory infection. A good percentage of the time it is. That's one of the more common things that will cause them to have debris up there. But the other thing that I've seen frequently too is birds that are throwing up. Because if a bird is throwing up, sometimes there is in the roof of the mouth, we'll kind of try, try to outline it here, in the roof of the mouth, inside the oral cavity, there's a little slit called the coene. That coene communicates with all these sinuses behind their head. They've got all these like little pockets of sinuses. And so if they're throwing up, sometimes the stuff they're throwing up will go up that coene into those nasal passages and then it kind of gets sprayed out on their nostrils and gets on the the feathers um, right by their nostrils. I would say I see that more commonly in the small birds so like the budgies and the cockatiels we see that frequently in so something to pay attention to because even though owners may not actually see a little budgie or a cockatiel doing something like throwing up um, sometimes the telltale signs are actually right up uh, along the, the head there against those feathers. So nostrils, and lamb, nostrils, yeah. the nostrils and nares are interchangeable, right? Yes. So I'm here nares and yes. And, and please, if I say anything that um, doesn't make any sense, just ask me, stop me. It's totally fine because I know sometimes I'll sense. get into a doctor talk and forget <laughs> to clarify. So, um, so no worries if you need to, to ask questions like that. Um, so yeah, nostrils, they should be clean, they should be clear, they should be symmetrical. That's step one. As we move back and look at the eyes, the eyes, they should be um, nice and bright. The corneal surface, so there's multiple layers to the eyes. And what we're actually seeing first, when you look at the eyes, um, you're gonna see your eyelids. And on those eyelids, some birds have really prominent uh, philoplumes. They look like little eyelashes, uh, but they're a special type of feather called a philoplume. And they just help get any debris sort of not uh, against, against the eye. Some of them have them a little bit more vibrant, um, others, others don't. Um, but we're looking at those eyelids, then deep to the eyelids is actually the clear corneal surface of the eye. It should be nice and clear, it shouldn't be hazy. Deep to that, the colored part of the eye is um, the iris. Um, and when you're looking at one eye to the next, they should be symmetrical with the coloration of the iris. Now the iris color, it might be uh, variable. And if you look at this picture of Arroyo, you can see towards the center of his iris, it's more yellow and then like, on the periphery, it's more orange. That's okay. There can be variation within the color of the iris, but it really should be symmetrical from one eye to the next. Both eyes should be the same. Color. It's not very common for you to have different colored irises. Occasionally it will happen, but it's something to take note of because sometimes there are certain disorders that could cause pigment changes to the iris. So 
if uh, you know, you're always looking at your bird and you're seeing that they have symmetrical uh, iris color um, and then suddenly it seems like one's different coloration than the other, that's a reason to get in to the vet and, and be seen. The next part of the eye that we can just see with our outward visual examination is that little pupil there, right on that pupil, that little black center portion of the eye. Um, right behind that is the lens. Now the lens is normally clear, but if you have something like a cataract, then it'll be sort of this white hazy appearance. Um, so in a normal bird, we want the corneal surface to be clear. We want the iris coloration to be symmetrical one side to the next. We want that lens the pupil to be that black appearance. Um, the other thing that's important to know about the eyes with birds that's a little different compared to mammals is birds actually have the ability to um, constrict and dilate their pupils at will. And so a lot of people have seen that, you know, with your pet birds, you may see them do what's called flashing with their eyes. When they get really excited, they suddenly constrict and dilate their pupils rapidly. Um, and we know that we can't do that. Um, and it's because there's different muscling within the iris of birds versus uh, other animals. So in other animals, if you look at the eyes, the pupil size should be symmetrical from one side to the next. And if they're asymmetrical from one side to the next, where one pupil's dilated and one small, then that's a big problem. But in birds, it might not necessarily be a problem because they have the ability to at will constrict and dilate their pupils. Um, so it's something that if you see that in another animal, be concerned. But if you see that in a bird, you may not really need to be so concerned. Um, it's something that you know you might want to talk with your veterinarian about and just make sure that there isn't something going on. But uh, because birds have the ability to at will move those pupils, it's usually okay. The other thing that we're looking for is any sort of discharge on the eyes. You know, there is a little duct that connects between the eye and the nasal passages. And so if there, and that duct, what it's doing is it's draining the normal tears that are flowing from the eye um, down into those nasal passages. And if you have like an upper respiratory infection, sometimes the bacteria or infectious agent, whatever it is, can work its way up that little duct um, and then cause ocular discharge. So sometimes we'll see nasal discharge and ocular discharge together when they have an upper respiratory infection. And you might see one before the other. Um, so if you see any sort of discharge, important to, to get them in. Um, next thing on our examination that we're looking at is their ears. Now, it's uh, fun because we don't see their ears very easily um, like we do in other animals. And I've had several times where owners have come in and said, oh, I'm going to look at his ears. And they say they have ears. <laughs> Shocked. <laughs> um, and, and they do. They're just hidden underneath their feathers. And so the ears are kind of just right sort of behind the eye and a little lower down, there's little ear hole openings um, that are just covered up by feathers. And a lot of times owners will see them when they're petting their bird's head. So if you're sitting there petting their head and um, giving them little head scratches, if you, if you pet on the side of the head, you might notice a small little opening on the side of the head. That's the ear just hiding underneath those. Good news is, is we don't see a lot of ear problems in birds, but they do occasionally happen. Um, and so, looking at that little spot, just making sure that you just see this round little opening that is, again, sort of free of any debris um, is appropriate. It shouldn't be red. It shouldn't be swollen. If you do see something that looks red or sort of poofy, uh, that could indicate swelling. That could indicate we have some sort of little infection going on and they need to be seen. But it's real easy for owners to, to look at that at home if your bird allows you to pet their head. If they don't allow you to pet their head, well, then it might be a little harder for you to actually get a good visual of that. I think sometimes you can kind of gently blow on their feather, right? And like maybe try to... Yeah. Yeah. Away, so to speak. Exactly. You could do that too. That'd be completely fine as long as they're okay with you doing that behavior towards them. Um, yeah, because those feathers right over that ear, if you, if you kind of look at the photo here, you can see he's got these bigger feathers here that are a little more heavy duty, but these ones that are actually covering the ear are very, like a little smaller and more fine. Um, so it's easy for them to kind of be um, blown off to the side. Um, next thing on our head is the beak. 
Um, so when we're looking at the beak, what we're looking for is we're looking to make sure that the upper beak is going over the lower beak, that we don't have any sort of like underbite kind of problem. We're also looking again for symmetry from one side to the next. Does it look like the beak is symmetrical? Um, we're also looking at sort of the texture of the beak. You can see in Arroyo's uh, picture here, he's kind of smooth up here, but then you get a little bit of uh, flaking and like a little ridge there, a little flaking there. Um, that's okay when I'm, when I'm looking at this. What we're really looking for is, is there any deep cracks in the beak? Um, is there anything where there's a puncture? You know, were they bit by another bird? We talked about that a few months ago with the safety first lecture um, and how when I've had birds get into fights with other birds, one of the most common places that gets injured is the beak. Um, so looking for any little punctures on the beak, cracks, those are the things that we're looking for. And again, looking for symmetry. Um, you know, you can also be looking at the beak for, for grooming purposes of, is the beak a little too long? Does it need to be trimmed a little bit? Um, and sort of the rule of thumb that I will often use is if you look at the tip of the beak here, if you drew, if you were to draw an imaginary line from the tip of the beak uh, to the back of the head here, just sort of straight across, if you drew an imaginary line there, that tip of the beak should really not be extending beyond the edge of the lower mandible. Now this photo is a little off because he's kind of tilting his head. So this one's a little hard to judge that on, but if we had him really kind of nice and straight, what we should see is that tip of that beak wouldn't be becoming on the becoming uh, longer than beyond the edge of this mandible. If it was, that means it's a little too long and we might have a little bit of grooming that's necessary. There is a little bit of ridges here. That's a little bit just sort of cosmetic, whether or not people would want to have those things trimmed out. Um, again, it's really more we're looking for cracks um, that can be a problem. Um, now, the other important thing to go along with the beak is looking on the inside of the beak. If they'll let you, not all birds are going to let you look inside their beak, but if you're able to like pet and, and um, you know, kind of groom their head with your fingers and scratch along their head, then sometimes you can even actually induce them to yawn a little bit. If you kind of scratch by that ear, that can actually induce some birds to yawn and open up their mouth. So it's a little trick that you can sometimes use at home to get them to open up their mouth if you want to have a look inside. So, you know, it's something with looking inside the beak, what we're looking at is we're looking at the tongue, we're looking at the roof of the mouth, we're looking for any like weird plaques or mucus um, in the oral cavity. And for some owners, it might be easy to do. For some owners, it might not be easy to do. I can tell you with my own birds, there's a couple that it would be easy for me to do at home, no problem. And some other ones, I need them to be handled by me in the towel and restraining them and using tools to, um, get a better look inside their mouth. I do have a photo um, of a bird who has some plaques in her mouth um, as the next slide here. So I'm gonna bring that one up. Oh, <laughs> no, sorry, this was a, I meant to show this one first. This was just Arroyo trying to, trying to me take a picture and demonstrate of him opening up his mouth. So sometimes you can like uh, get them to open their mouth by holding a treat or something in front of them uh, to get them to open that mouth wide up so you can uh, manipulate and, and kind of have a look in there. But okay, this is the photo that I wanted to show. Um, in the hospital, when I'm looking at a bird, if I'm not able to easily open his mouth and uh, I need to use a tool, there's a little tool that I can use to open up their mouth. But what I'm looking for is, is plaques. Is there any sort of weird plaque, discoloration, mass-like problem in that oral cavity? And I'm also really looking at the roof of the mouth as well. As I mentioned earlier, there's a little slit on the roof of the mouth called the coene. And that coene is an opening to the sinuses behind the bird's like head, behind the eyes on the top head. Um, and that coene has these little projections on it called papillae. Um, and those kind of help filter out debris from getting up into the sinuses. And so as a veterinarian, I'm often looking at those areas to make sure that those papillae look healthy, that they don't look abnormal in any way. So if I was at home and I saw my bird had these cheesy looking plaques in the mouth, that's definitely abnormal. And that's something that the bird needs to come into the hospital to be seen to find out what's going on in there. Is there an infection? Um, what kind of infection could it be? Because you could have bacteria that cause these sort of plaques. You could have yeast that cause these sort of plaques, or you could have something um, 
else causing these kind of these plaques to occur. So, so um, something to be looking for in the oral cavity. One thing I will also mention is that different birds have different pigment in their oral cavity. So African greys tend to have a lot of black pigmentation, though they may have a little bit of pink pigmentation further back, um, versus like little budgies, um, cockatiels, they have tend to have more pink coloration um, in their oral cavity. So it does vary from one species to the next, um, but generally black or pink is appropriate coloration. And um, if you're used to getting a little bit of visualization in your bird's mouth and you notice some odd coloration that you haven't noticed before, again, an indication to, to get them seen. All right, so moving along from the head, now we're gonna move over the body of the bird. Um, and when we're looking sort of over the body of the bird, I try to break it down into a few different areas that I'm gonna be assessing. <clears throat> And um, to start off with, after I've moved away from the head, the first area that I'm assessing is the crop. And the crop, um, as many bird owners know, is the area where a bird um, will first bring, when they first eat, they store food down in the crop, which is just a dilation of the esophagus. And so they store food there and then it slowly moves down from the crop down into the different parts of their lower gastrointestinal tract, their proventriculus, ventriculus, and then into their intestines. Um, if a bird has just eaten, then that crop can be very full and, and uh, distended. So if like Arroyo in this photo here, you can see he's got a bunch of stuff on his beak because he just had a snack. Um, and today, right now, he just had a snack too. Um, so if I were to feel his crop right now, um, I would feel that it would be kind of this soft little lumpy area there. Versus if, they, if you haven't had anything to eat, then what you're gonna feel is more this sort of like indentation right at that spot. If you kind of feel on your neck where you kind of get that little like uh, U-shaped dip on your neck, that's kind of how it's gonna feel um, if the crop is empty because what you end up feeling is sort of the bone, um, which is the keel bone, the start of the keel bone that sits just underneath that crop. Um, so it's, the crop may be big, it may be small, it's just gonna depend on when the bird actually last ate. It's important though to pay attention to that area because if that crop is always full, it's always distended, it never goes down, that's a problem. Um, if a crop is always full and it never goes down, then there could potentially be some disorder going on. Um, there's various infections they can get within the crop or infections that can secondarily affect the crop or disorders that can just sort of slow motility of the gastrointestinal tract, all of which can make that crop stay permanently, or um, I, mean, I shouldn't say permanently, but abnormally distended for longer periods of time than it should. So if you're seeing a chronically full crop and it's never going down, that's a problem and they need to get checked out. Um, after feeling the crop, you kind of move down from that crop over the chest area. Now birds are unique because they have a bone over that chest um, called the keel. And it's this solid like breastplate um, is the way a lot of people will describe it. And actually the keel is where the muscles for flight attach to. So if you have a bird that's a really great flyer, then they tend to have that muscle mass that's over the keels be really well developed um, and be sort of really robust. Uh, versus if you have a bird who doesn't do a lot of flight, then they may not have as good of musculature there. Um, but the reason we like to feel that keel is because the other purpose of feeling that keel is to get an idea of if they're underweight, overweight, or appropriate. Um, every time a, a bird comes into the hospital, we do what's called a body condition scoring, where we tell an owner this is the body condition score of your bird on a scale of either one to five or one to nine, depending upon which sort of scale system you like to use. But it gives us an idea of, are they emaciated? Because if we use the one to five scale, one is emaciated, very thin, we have a big problem. 
Three is ideal. That's where you always want your bird to be. If we're doing the uh, body condition score of five scale, we want them on a, a three versus a five is obese. So we've got a problem on either extreme end. Um, and so what we're doing is we're actually feeling the muscle mass over the keel. The way that you do that is you just kind of run your hand from one side to the next. And so if I use my mouse right here to go over Arroyo's chest on this picture, basically I'm running my hand across the chest from one side to the next. What I should feel right in the center of the chest is I should feel a slight um, prominence of the bone. That keel bone has a little central portion and it kind of comes out. Um, and so your muscle mass on either side of that should kind of kind of like slowly come up over it almost like a little mound is how it should sort of feel. If you were to imagine looking at the bird laying on its side and you imagined uh, a little hill of some sort, sort of like a mound shape is what it should feel like. If they're too skinny, what'll happen is that muscle mass shrinks back and that keel bone becomes more prominent. And people will say they are sharp in the keel. And so you can feel this bone very easily. And when you're feeling from one side to the next, as you cross over that keel bone, it's almost like a mountain peak. So it kind of comes up really sharp and then dips down. So um, on the opposite end of the scale, if we have a bird who's a little too chubby, um, it feels flat. It feels like a mesa. <laughs> it's just a flat surface. And sometimes you even have a little bit of cleavage um, where the muscle mass is like expanding a little bit up above that keel ridge in the center. So um, feeling that keel helps us to know, are we underweight, are we overweight, or are we just right where we need to be? And it does take a little bit of work getting used to what's normal. So it's good to, when you go take your bird to do their annual examinations with your veterinarian, um, if you could feel the, the keel while they're feeling it and they can tell you, hey, this feels appropriate, this is what you want to feel, that way you can kind of get an idea of, okay, this is what I should be feeling. And if I don't feel this when I'm doing my just uh, little evaluations at home, then, you know, I know that I need to, to be seen. Um, so the other thing as we are looking at them, um, looking at the, the body portion here, after we're done feeling the crop, feeling the keel, um, then we wanna go down to the abdomen. Um, I have a few different pictures of, of the bird's abdomen because bird abdomens, I always think they're really important to pay attention to. Um, I've picked up on a lot of different diseases with my physical exam, um, being able to feel a bird's abdomen. And it's really kind of a difficult thing for owners to see at home. And the reason being is because of those feathers. Those feathers are in the way and they kind of obscure our view of really seeing what's going on with the abdomen. But to just orient you, the abdomen is the lower part of the body here. It's beyond the edge of the keel. So that keel is taking up a good central portion of the bird's body. And then beyond the edge of that keel, you have your abdomen. Normally, the abdomen is concave. So if you were to feel a bird's abdomen, it's concave and it kind of tucks up. Um, and it's the skin over that abdomen is often very tight, almost like the head of a drum. Um, so it's really tight and con uh, concave there. When I'm feeling a bird's abdomen, if that skin doesn't feel as tight as it should, or if the abdomen feels distended, that's an abnormality. That's a definite cause for concern. And when you're feeling at home, you, you have to, I will say, feeling that a bird's abdomen at home, some owners might not be able to do this because some owners, some birds aren't going to allow it. Some birds are not going to allow an owner to really feel down in that area. And I wouldn't push it so much with them because we don't want to make our birds uncomfortable in our own home. So I, I do want to have that side note. Um, but if your bird does allow you to feel down there, just taking a quick light palpation, it should feel concave, it should feel kind of tight. Um, if it doesn't, then that's cause for concern. I also want to say, word of caution, don't touch there too long because it's a very sexually stimulating area to touch. If we're feeling there, it's purely for the purpose of, can I just feel to make sure it feels uh, concave and tight? If it feels great, good, done. Don't continue to touch over that area because you're very close to the vent and it's a very hormonally stimulating area. So caution. Um, but if it does feel distended um, or if it doesn't feel so tight, then again, cause for concern and need to bring them in. Now, if your bird doesn't let you feel that area, what can you do for visualization purposes? Um, well, for visualization purposes, I think I have it. Oh, I'll, for visualization purposes, let me go to this one. Oops. 
here we go. Um, for visualization purposes, if they're on a perch, you can kind of look underneath them and just see, does it look like that abdomen is sort of tucked in or does it look distended in any way? Arroyo's perching here on a nice little uh, tree for us. And I can see that it doesn't look like the feathers of his abdomen are coming over the perch. If the feathers of that abdomen are kind of coming over the perch, then that can be an indication that something's distended and it's getting, the abdomen is getting pushed up against that perch. So that's one thing that I can do. The other thing that I can do is I can look at them from the side. And so here I have Arroyo climbing this tree. Um, and what I should be seeing when I'm looking him, at him from the side here, an abdomen that is not distended um, should kind of have this sort of shape flat going back towards the tail. So if you have this nice sort of flat incline back towards the tail, that's what you want to see. You're not gonna see the concave appearance so much because again, those feathers are in the way. So it should look flat and just coming at an incline sharply back to the tail. If it looks like it is distended in any way, that's a problem. Um, and again, cause for concern and reason for us to have them checked out. Um, because we're down by that abdomen, the next part to look at is the vent. So the vent is the common opening um, where you have your, your cloaca and that is the like, common excretory organ for the reproductive tract, the kidneys and the gastrointestinal tract. So birds are different than mammals. They have one area where everything, all their excretory products dump into before they come out the vent. So there is just one single opening down here. Now, typically for at home evaluation, really the main thing you wanna be looking for when we're looking at the vent is making sure the feathers are clean. If the feathers are dirty, because most birds are very meticulously clean um, and they like to keep everything nice and, and proper back there. Um, and if there is fecal material or urates, the urates are the white part of the dropping. If there's any of that that's on the feathers near the vent, that's a little weird um, and not quite right. If it's just a one-time thing, then no, oh, maybe they just hadn't cleaned themselves yet. But if it's something that you're seeing consistently, fecal or urate material near the vent, that's a problem um, and certainly cause for concern and they need to be seen. Um, I wasn't gonna talk at all about doing any sort of evaluation further up the cloaca because that is not something you want to do at home. Again, that can be very hormonally stimulating, not appropriate to do at home. That's something you want to leave for the vet. So the main thing that I want you guys to be looking for at home when you're doing your at home examination is just look at the feathers in that area, make sure there isn't any fecal material accumulating. Um, the, the next thing then is the tail. And I'm going to go back to uh, this image of Arroyo to talk about the tail for a moment. Um, and the reason I'm going to, to that image is because one of the big things to look at, I think that a lot of owners do know about um, to look for is a tail bob. The tail normally in a bird, when they are just perching on a perch, uh, they normally hold it pretty straight and they will not often have much movement to it at all. If there is a bob to that tail where that tail's kind of going up and down with breathing efforts, um, that's a cause for concern. Now, if they just flew around and they were really active and they were being a little athlete, um, just like if we were running a marathon at the end, you may breathe a little heavier while you're just uh, recovering um, from the exercise you just had. Same thing with them. If they were just flying around and, and being really active, then and they stop and they're perching for a moment and you see them bobbing their tail just a little bit and then it resolves. Okay, that's normal. That was just exertion, a little bit of exercise. But if you see them just hanging out on the perch and they weren't doing any sort of exertional exercise and that tail is bobbing, that usually means that they're working harder to breathe than they should. So Arroyo in this photo here is demonstrating this nice straight tail. Um, and I can, when we're done here, I can hold him up and we can just uh, watch how he breathes um, and see that his tail really won't be moving much at all. Um, so if you're seeing that tail moving with rest, potentially a problem and it's bobbing up and down. Now they may shake their tail and, and uh, groom and do that sort of stuff. Again, totally normal. It's the bob that we are looking for that could indicate a problem. Um, now we're gonna go back up a little bit here. And the next thing I wanna talk about is the feet. Um, so 
if your bird will let you, you can feel along the legs just to make sure it feels symmetrical from one side to the next. Not all birds are going to allow that. That's okay if they don't allow that. The big thing that you really want to pay attention to is how are they standing? Are they holding their food appropriately? And when you're looking at the toes themselves, um, you are looking to see, uh, do the scales look appropriate? Now, again, birds have scales on their feet, so they're gonna have a slight dry appearance, but do they look too dry? Are there areas that are red on the bottom of the foot? The bottom of the foot is the real big area to be paying attention to. If it looks like that bottom of the foot has any red spots, um, or even thinning of the scales, because when a bird has a condition known as bumblefoot, you'll see redness to the feet bottoms, but then you also see the scales get sort of this thinner appearance to them. So they'll look more smooth or shiny. And then it, after that, it can actually ulcerate and you can have a lesion on the bottom of the foot. So looking at the bottom of the feet at home, the things you wanna be paying attention to is making sure they're not too dry, making sure that they're not red, making sure that there isn't anything um, really thinning with the scales. Um, looking at the toenails at the same time, making sure the toenails are not overgrown or curling, making sure that they kind of have a smooth appearance to them. And then just again with the, the functioning of the foot that when they're perching, they're grasping with equal strength. Um, if you have them perch on your hand or your finger, depending upon the size of your bird, when you feel them grasping you, does it feel like they are equally bearing weight with their feet? Or do they seem like they're weak with one foot over another? Now, if they're just kind of shifting their body around, then of course they're gonna be bearing more weight with one foot than another, but it's more consistency. Do they consistently um, maybe shift their body so that maybe their one foot is held up um, or they're not putting as much weight on it? If they're consistently doing something like that, then that can be an indication of a problem. Um, okay. And then the next part that I wanted to talk about was the wings. Um, so we kind of went a little bit back and then we went from head to bottom and then just to the extremities. I uh, something real quick. People yeah. are always amazed, um, to find out that birds knees, so to speak, are way, um, higher than you think, right? Aren't they yes. a little bit higher up than you would imagine? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, uh, and sometimes people will say, oh, the bird's knees are backwards, but they're not. Because what we're often seeing, and we'll go back to that sort of image, um, the, the anatomy with their bones is actually not all that different from ours. It's just that the individual bones um, may be a little longer or shorter with certain bones. And so you get this slightly different shape. Um, and the, the words are kind of covering right up the spot that I was going to talk about, but right here, so that is sort of our, that's our ankle. Um, you know, the, the uh, hawk is what we call it in birds, dogs, cats. It's called the hawk joint. Um, but on us, that's actually the ankle. Um, and so if we were to imagine his little legs underneath all these feathers, because those feathers cover everything up and make certain things not visible to us. Um, if we were to follow that, that leg up, um, the tibia on us is the tibiotarsis on them. His knee is probably like right up over here. It's just covered by those feathers right now and you can't see it easily. On this foot here, that's where the hawk is. And we kind of could follow the leg along and his knee on this one is probably somewhere over here. So it's just really well hidden by the feathers. Um, so it's kind of kind of interesting. Thanks. All right. Um, so. Uh, back to the, the wings, um, the upper extremities here. Um, when we're looking at the wings, the things that we want to look at at home with our at-home physical exam goes back to symmetry. Um, they should be holding their wings pretty symmetrical. So when we look at the right versus the left, they really should be in a, in a pretty uh, symmetrical position from one side to the other. Uh, I like showing the back of the birds because you can see the wings a little bit easier and you can kind of see if there's any sort of drooping. Look at the front of the bird as well, because sometimes they may droop at their wrist a little bit. Um, but really, again, it's symmetry. Are they holding the wings in an equal position from one side to the next? If they are not, 
then that is abnormal. Now, Arroyo is showing us here where he has one wing tucked under the other. That's okay. You can have that be a little bit um, asymmetrical in that regard um, versus uh, my gray over here. She has both her wings just kind of touching right at the tips. She's not overlapping in any way. Um, both of these are just variations of normal. He just decided to hold his wings this way. It's totally fine. What I'm looking for is like, what are his wrists doing? What are the elbows doing? Um, and again, in a moment in time, a bird may droop its wing for a second because they may be stretching or standing in a little weird way. So if you see something for just a second, it could be nothing. It's more the consistently, are they, or consistency, are they consistently um, holding a wing ab abnormally? Um, so that is sort of the, the overall head to, to toe evaluation, the things to really be looking out for, the eyes, nostrils, beak, ears, crop, keel, abdomen, uh, feet, vent, wings. Um, so, and I'm gonna, let me stop screen sharing for a moment and I'll get a royal here. All right, so I just wanna show the, the breathing thing. Can you step up for me? Good boy. So I'm gonna kind of hold him for a moment. We'll just talk for a second. But when he's just standing here, <laughs> he might be a little mobile. But if you look at him from the side, you can see that, well, he's just <laughs> talking, that was great. <laughs> but he's a bird, they love to do that. Um, as he is just kind of here relaxing, you can see that that tail is pretty motionless. He's not bobbing it up and down with his breathing. He's holding it really quite steady. So as he's just relaxing on my hand, that's what I wanna see. I want to see him holding that tail nice and just normal, uh, sort of sharp point to back and no bobbing up and down. If he was bobbing that tail with his breathing, then I would be worried that, okay, this bird's working a lot harder to breathe than he should. And I need to be getting him to the vet because I need to find out why he's working so hard to breathe right now. So. Um, and again, the other thing I think that's really important, I try to emphasize a little bit is, you know, you don't want to stress your bird at home with doing these examinations. You want to um, go at their pace, let them uh, be okay with what you are doing. You may not be able to feel all those different things that I talked about, but if you can at least get visualizations um, of certain areas and, you know, work with them of, hey, I need to look at the bottom of your foot. Let me, let me give you a treat. Grab it with your foot so I can kind of see for a moment what the bottom of your foot looks like. Or, oh, I want to look in your mouth. Here's a treat. Hold your mouth open for a moment um, to let me get a, a good look. You know, using those sort of things as um, ways to uh, cooperate with them and not forcing them to, to, to do it. Because we don't want them to be stressed at home. So, so that is my uh, basics of a physical examination uh, at home for for you guys. So what questions do you okay, have? Okay, great. Um, well, we do have we do have some questions. Um, oh, so um, so Karen asks, um, several guests have mentioned that meat baby foods are not acceptable for birds, but no one has um, said why. And her question is like, why? Okay. So I'm imagining like little Gerber jars of, you know, like meat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we've learned, we've come a long way with bird nutrition. Um, and things that were once appropriate or what we thought were appropriate, uh, some things have been kind of falling out of favor. And where people used to say, it's okay for them to have a little bit of meat. Um, and you'll even find that in some older bird books. What we've been finding out as, as we learn more um, with birds that are living longer in our homes than what they used to is we are starting to see certain like older age diseases. And one of the most common older age diseases that we're seeing is heart disease with them. Um, there's a very common heart disease called atherosclerosis that we're seeing pop up more and more in, in pet birds. And there are links to the diet being potentially problematic and um, being a contributing factor to that particular heart disease. And one of the things that there's been a lot of talk about is, you know, meat-based foods in their diet. Cholesterol, which is a fat, only comes from animal sources. It doesn't come from plant sources. And so if you're feeding your bird an animal product, it could potentially have 
cholesterol along with it, depending upon what it is you're feeding. Um, and so a wild bird's diet, they're normally not eating any animal products. Certain species will be getting certain bugs during time during certain times of the year. So like during breeding season, you will see some parrots that may eat a bug here or there, but it's not a huge part of their diet. It, it can be a little bit here or there, but nothing substantial. Um, so, so really in the wild, their diets just don't have, for pet parrots, don't have really meat in them. And there's been studies that have shown that they have been very effective at um, getting, uh, absorbing cholesterol when they have it in their diet. So therefore they, when they're getting these animal products, they might be getting some cholesterol and they may, might be predisposing them to these uh, cardiovascular conditions, atherosclerosis. Um, and then there have been other studies that have looked at like too much protein in the diet in cockatiels, and they've shown them to get what's called lipogranulomas. So these like fatty inflammatory deposits in the liver. So um, it's kind of been coming more into favor to not have any animal products really in the diet of pet birds um, because of the potential for cardiovascular problems or, or liver problems that's been shown in cocktails um, with high protein diets. So that's really the reason against it. Now, if a bird has something every once in a while, it's probably not the end of the world. Just like if you or I eats you know, something that maybe we shouldn't have every once in a while. Um, but you just don't want to make any habits out of it. You don't want to make it a routine thing at all. Because again, in the wild, they're really not getting animal products. And if they are, it's like a bug, you know? So it's, it's quite different um, than the typical animal products that we consume, you know? Okay. Um, and then uh, Wynn wanted to know, um... What about, a, the, so a, a small black spot in the iris, what, what could that indicate? Okay, well, sometimes you'll just have a little bit of pigment. Sometimes there'll just be a little bit of pigment in the iris. Um, and the when you do have like a little odd pigment, the important thing is one, have a veterinarian have a look at it just to make sure it doesn't look like it's bulging because if it's kind of a, just a flat pigment, then it's something to notate and keep an eye on. Um, but if it's kind of bulging, then we worry about things like, you know, could there potentially be some sort of infectious thing, cancers or something that you can sometimes see too. Now, birds' eye colors do change as they age. You know, we certainly see that very easily with our young baby parrots when they mature. Um, we see that eye color change. But then as parrots get older too and become more uh, senior, you can see their eye color iris change a little bit as well. Um, but it's going to be a very slow, subtle change with that. You don't want to be seeing any sudden like, oh my gosh, now there is some little black spot that I've never seen before. And I have pictures to show that that was never there. Um, you know, if you do see that infection or, or sadly cancers or something that we could potentially see and, and good reason to get them checked out by a veterinarian. Okay. And so Mary wanted to know, she doesn't know the term for it, and I don't either, but what are the little, uh, she says pumps around the skin margins around the eye. I don't know if she means pumps or bumps. Um, oh, like where she wonders if they can get inflamed or irritated and some species seem to have larger ones than others. Yeah, so there's little glands right there. Um, and that's where the little phyllo plumes come out. Um, and so it's just little little glandular areas. And that's why they kind of look sort of bigger. Arroyo's got pretty nice eyelashes, I think. Um, and you can kind of see by his where he's got those little, little uh, bumps where they kind of come out. They can get infected. Um, they can sometimes get impacted. And you can have like a little white bump there. And if that happens, then often they need to be drained, essentially, because it can be uncomfortable for them. Um, and it's kind of like it can happen to us, like when we get a sty in your eye, um, it's kind of a similar situation. So. Okay, interesting. Um, and then Judith wanted to see, so they have an African gray that is very highly, high strung, type A personality, um, <laughs> ha, uh, as, has had some kind of seizure, uh, seizure when manhandled by the vet when she was young and lived with our daughter. We inherited her 21 years ago and took her to a vet for an examination. And the same thing happened. The vet was scared and said, we shouldn't do this since she might have a heart attack. So she's 31, year old, 31 years old now and has been healthy except for her mental issues. Um, so advise that we leave her well enough alone, like in her age. You know, that's a, that's a difficult one. Um, 
because you don't, you certainly want to stress a bird to the point where it has seizures. But, but I will say that that is something that is something you occasionally can see. Thankfully, we don't see it very often, but occasionally with stress, it can induce a seizure to occur. Now, if there's never been any other seizures other than when we're highly stressed with an examination, um, it's something that what might be best to do is have the bird be sedated before any sort of examination. I know that sounds a little scary. Sometimes people hear the word sedation and can be a little scared about it, but sedation can actually be, it, it is very safe. Um, and what it does is it can kind of help take the edge off. The most common sedatives that we actually use, if we're gonna do an exam and we wanna sedate them so that they're not nervous, um, the most common sedatives that we use actually have anti-seizure properties to them. So that's something they might want to consider talking about their veterinarian with is, you know, when this bird does need an examination for, because, you know, at, at 30, if we've only been to the vet twice, it probably would be a good idea to be seen at some point. You may not necessarily do it annually, like we usually recommend, maybe, it, you know, every few years, every five years or something like that even would be appropriate for that individual. But it probably is still good to be seen because a 30 year old bird, um, it's good to do things like get blood work checked and make sure that they have uh, normal fat levels, normal liver function, kidney function. Um, but in order to keep them as stress free and uh, safe as possible, sedation might be a good thing to talk about with your veterinarian. And I'll tell you with my own birds, um, one of my birds, if there's ever anything that I, I am going to do with her, um, I sedate her because she does uh, much more, she, she does better when she is sedated. Um, and we just use a nice light sedation. She gets nice and relaxed. We do what we need to, and then everything's good and, and life is great. So, um, if something like that happens, it's important to talk about, um, sedation beforehand to be safe. Okay. That's a, and then Emojin asks, uh, when giving, um, antibiotics to a bird in a syringe, should you administer it on a full crop or an empty crop? Um, so sometimes there's a couple answers to that. Um, and it, the answer is it depends. Um, and it depends on the type of antibiotic that is being used. Um, some, or any medication really, some medications are better to be given on an empty stomach um, or an empty crop. Um, some medications are good to be given with um, uh, food. And I would say most, most antibiotics tend to be good to be given with food. Um, it seems to be a little bit more um, gentle on their stomach, but it really does depend on the individual medication. So that would be something that, depending upon what medication your veterinarian prescribes, um, you would want to ask them at that time to know what's appropriate for that specific medication. Uh, we have an anatomy a question for you. Raquel asks, do male parrots have Adam apples? Um, so <laughs> that's, it. I mean, I guess no, but the way that birds, um, when you're looking at their neck and like, okay, when, when we're looking at a Royal from the side here, he looks like he just kind of has this nice straight neck, right? But he actually doesn't underneath all those feathers. Cause again, feathers love to hide things. He actually has sort of an S shaped curve to his neck. Um, and so if he was suddenly featherless, what we would actually see is sort of this S-shaped curve. And because of that S-shaped curve, you would kind of have some of the bones kind of stick out a little bit there. So you could kind of say it's an Adam's apple. I guess it's not technically, um, because that's actually the, the Adam's apple um, is really uh, sort of the glottis um, of your trachea uh, that's kind of bulging a little bit right there. Um, but so it's really the bones on the S-shaped curve of their neck that would be bulging. So it's a little different anatomically, but I could see how he, uh, someone could confuse it for that. <laughs> would that be the same for female birds? Would yeah. they have the same, so they wouldn't be like separate? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so Mary asks, what's an appropriate nail length? Um, I've had the opportunity to see wild Alexandrians, and I was surprised um, how short they were. I recently read a UK article and the author said that nails should be longer to ensure a very good grip on a perch, especially when sleeping. I, I occasionally hear about parrots falling off perches when sleeping and I have a son, Conyer, that does this. Um, that says he is healthy. Could this be a reason? Um, so the, the question of how long to, the nails should be. Um, generally what I, I 
to give a visualization, if we're kind of like looking at a foot and it's on a flat surface, that nail, as it kind of comes down, um, or, let me, let me, I might be able to do this better if I start to draw a picture here um, of a nail. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's my nail, my toe. Very good. Um, and here's the nail. And what we do is imagine a imaginary line from the bottom of the toe and etch it sort of across and sort of right where it comes across right there. That's how much you want to take off. <laughs> Hopefully that makes somewhat sense. Um, so uh, if they were kind of holding that straight and just that imaginary line from the bottom, kind of like what I talked about with the bottom of the beak, imaginary lines, if it goes beyond that imaginary line, it's a little too long. Um, the, the, the nails do need to be a certain length so that they can grasp appropriately because if you do have them clipped too short then especially after just having the nail trim done if they're clipped a little too short then they may grasp a little differently um, and they could potentially fall from a perch. Um, to answer the question of is that the reason why her bird's falling from the perch it's a possibility but it's something that's going to be best answered by the veterinarian who's looking at that bird at that time because they can actually look at the foot and see how long are those nails? Do they look like they're appropriate? Do they look like they're too long, too short? Um, are they seeing other things on their examination or in the questioning of the history? Are there other things that we can key in on and say, oh, wait a second, there was also this other time when such and such happened. So it's a little hard for me to answer that other than to say it's possible it could be a reason for falling in the perch, but it's also possible that there's other reasons for falling from the perch too. Okay. And then Frank has a uh, blue, a three-year-old blue fronted Amazon, and he wants to know what are the white striations on the beak? Are they normal? Are, um, they have the white stri striations on the beak? Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. The beak color does, or pigment varies uh, a little bit from, from uh, species to species. And interestingly, in the Amazons, there's, I feel like, a little bit more variation. And you'll see also a little bit more variation in like the the cockatiels sometimes. Um, but yes, sometimes your blue front Amazons can have a little bit of like white striations. Um, I guess the thing to look for is, does it look smooth? If it looks nice and smooth, fine. Um, but if you look at the surface and those striations look like they're actual like ridges or, and you feel you run your finger over it, it doesn't feel smooth, it feels like ridges, then that could potentially be a little bit of an irregularity that you might wanna get checked out. Now, again, sometimes if it's just like the normal keratin growth, then it might have a little bit of ridge to it. Um, but it's really, when you're looking at that beak um, from like the top down, if the ridges are coming from the top down, from the base down, then that's an irregularity versus if the ridges are kind of coming from the side and it's not a crack, um, then that is just sort of a cosmetic thing. And it's just like a little bit of the keratin peeling. Um, that's not a big deal. Okay, and it looks like uh, we're almost um, out of time with the questions, but just I, I, I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, are there exceptions to the rule with the beak as far as the the even length, um, like hyacinth macaws or? Yes, okay. yeah, so so I, I use that as a general rule, but there are there are exceptions here and there. Um, and so yes, like for example, as you mentioned, the hyacinth macaws, they've got this a little bit longer, uh, more narrowish little beak. Um, and some of the cockatoos too um, are gonna have that little longer appearance. So yes, there is a variation that uh, what I mentioned is sort of a, general rule but doesn't fit every single species oh and and so your vet will let you know like obviously yes. when it was yeah. appropriate. okay well that is um that went by super fast um uh so dr lamb wanted to thank you for answering all those questions um and if we didn't get to your question we will send you an email uh, with the answer hopefully soon um so uh, thank you for everyone who participated today. Um, and Dr. Lamb, again, thank you. And thank you, Arroyo, for being a, a very good birdie back there. Um, <laughs> so I, I have to announce, I'm gonna go ahead and announce our winner uh, for today's raffle. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, I did not, but um, we do have one person that's going to be sent a, a bag of the new tropical fruit pellets, as well as a Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. And the winner, for today is Marilyn H. So congratulations, uh, Marilyn. You'll have um, someone from the Fever office will contact you on Monday and send that out to you. And um, and also next Friday, we are going to have um, Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. So that'll be uh, 12 p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time next Friday.
Um, so Dr. Lamb, thank you so much for um, that, that run through. Um, that was extremely valuable information. So great. <laughs> get to know our birds a little bit better. Um, on that note, I wanted to say um, everybody have a great weekend. Um, everyone stay safe and all the best to you and your flock. Bye. Bye.